Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the tragic murder of Mary Ann Murphy. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before we get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Aura. So, I have a question for you. Have you ever Googled your name and you were shocked to see your personal information just right out there for anyone to see on one of those like public listing sites? It is far more common for that to take place than you even realize. Like, okay, for example, I worked at a law firm for many years, like almost a decade before I had this job. And when you work at a law firm, sometimes you have to serve things. So you have to locate people. So I was able to find people like my office was able to find people so easy. And it's because data brokers, man, data brokers are out there and they get your information and then they sell it to people that you really don't want to have it. Like they're making dollar dollar bills y'all on your information by giving your information to people like scammers, robocallers, and they can find out so much stuff about you, dude. They can even find out where you live. And let me tell you, I am not down with that sickness. I value my privacy and I value your privacy. And that is why I want to introduce you to Aura. Now, did you know that data brokers are legally required to take your information off, like to stop selling your information if you ask them to? Sounds great, right? Except they make it super hard to do so. So if you've ever tried, first off, you have to figure out which data brokers have your information. Then you have to contact each of them and then you have to get them to cancel, right? You have to ask them to cancel. Well, that's where Aura comes in for me. Aura identifies which of those pesky data brokers have your information. And then they, on your behalf, submit opt-out requests for you. So you don't have to go through all that trouble because it's not fun, my guy. When I signed up for Aura, I immediately went to the section, like you'll see, you'll see if you go. I immediately went to the section that said data broker opt out. And when I went there, I saw that over 30 brokers had my information and had been selling it to all of these scammers, right? So Aura proactively had already sent out a bunch of removal requests for me. They also go on and see if your information has been leaked on the dark web, which nobody wants to be on the dark web. And they check to see if your passwords that you use are like good passwords, if they're strong passwords, if they've been leaked on the internet so that they are compromised and they need to be changed. And this is something I was interested in because I have had the same password since like 2007. Like I just keep reusing it. And I was worried that maybe I should change it. Maybe it's not good, but, or let me know that my password is actually super strong. Like it is tough as all get out. So I don't need to change it. And those are just a couple of things that Aura can do to protect you and your family from online threats that you might just not be able to even see. Through just the Aura app, which is super easy to set up, you can get things like parental controls, which I'm going to be needing eventually, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. And you get it all in one place without like several apps. You know what I mean? You get it all in one compact little place and at one affordable price. Win, win, win. It sounds like a great deal to me. And listen, I'm not your mom. I can't tell you what to do. But what I can tell you is that I don't want you to let people exploit and profit off of your private information. And you don't have to. You can let Aura do the hard work for you, like keeping you safe online. And of course, I have great news for you. Aura is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to explore all they have to offer for free for two weeks through the link in my description box. So if all of that sounds as good to you as it does to me, go to aura.com slash Bratterstein, or you can just go in my description box and click it to get a 14 day free trial to see if your personal information has been leaked online. And if it has, let Aura help you put a stop to it. And now I just want to say a big thank you to Aura for sponsoring today's video. It's sponsors like Aura that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. All right, now that I'm done spreading the good word of Aura, we can get into today's video. Now, today's video is on a case that I had never heard of, and I stumbled upon it while I was researching another case. A tale as old as time for me. And it was the headlines of this case that really grabbed me and sucked me in. Now, I'm not going to tell you what those headlines were because this is a very, like, it's a roller coaster of a case, and I want to give it to you in a very concise way. But when I tell you this is a wild one and there is so much to go through, like, wow. So today I'm going to tell you the whole story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it knocking around in your brain while we go through all the details of this case. But then at the end, I want you to answer. I want you to have all the information. And the question of the day is this. 
who do you believe was the mastermind of the murder of Mary Ann Murphy? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through all the details of this case. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of Mary Ann Murphy. Our story begins in mid-July of 2012, and it's about 1 a.m. when a frantic call comes in to 911. The girl on the other end of the line is a 16-year-old girl named Carrie Murphy, and she tells police that someone had come and kicked in the back door of her home while she and her mother, which was 47-year-old Mary Ann Murphy, were alone in the home. Her father, Don, was gone. He was at work, so it was leaving just the girls alone. She says she wakes up to the door being kicked in. She hears her mother screaming, and she's terrified, so she books it from the house, and she actually runs to a neighbor's house where she calls 911. So police show up at the scene. They think that there's a possibility that there's still like an active home invasion going on and that they're going to be like, you know, encountering somebody nefarious. So they're ready to rock and roll. So police arrive at the home and the home was located at the 8300 block of Poplar Ridge Lane. And they meet Carrie outside who tells them that two men had kicked in her back door, broke into the house, and had attacked her mother when she, when she left. So police go in, and they're clearing the house. They're going room for room to see what's going on in each room that they check. They go in, it's clear, it's empty. And that's until they make it to the very back bedroom. When they open that door, they find a horrible scene. Marianne was there, she was laying on her bed, and she was clearly deceased. She had been stabbed over and over and over. So outside, Carrie learns that her mother has been murdered, and she's in just absolute hysterics, dude. She has to call her brother. Her brother, a Scott, was working the graveyard shift, so she has to call him and tell him that somebody broke into their house and murdered their mother, which I cannot imagine receiving a call like that. And Scott had to go and call their father, Don, and give him the news, which just sounds like a horrifying experience. Meanwhile, police are inside the house. They're processing the scene, and they look at Marianne, and they see that she clearly went through hell. She had stab wounds like all over her body, dude. Her legs, her arms, her hands, her face, her chest, and she had numerous slash marks to her neck. She had been stabbed more than 70 times, and clearly she was alive for some of them because she had defensive wounds like slash marks on her hands and on her arms. This was a shocking crime, and it was terrifying to the neighbors. Like, in this small area, they were, like, shocked that something this brutal could happen in their neighborhood, just down the street at a house that, like, after Marianne was killed, had, like, a wreath and flowers and a photo of her by the front door. They couldn't understand how this could happen. Like, they didn't know the Murphys super well. They were kind of a quiet family that kept to themselves, but they weren't, like, outwardly bad either. They weren't, like, a seedy element in the neighborhood, and they couldn't understand why somebody would do this to Marianne. She was a 47-year-old mother of two, you know? She had an older son named Scott, and then after that she had her daughter Carrie, and she had both of these babies with her, her husband Don, who she had met super young. I believe they were high school sweethearts. So they started dating, they got engaged, they got married, they built a life together, they worked hard to make ends meet with Don being a metal worker, and Marianne working for the Department of Public Safety. And then they went on to have their little babies, you know, Scott and then Carrie, and they were so happy. They loved their family, they loved kids, they always wanted to be parents, and now they were. Marianne loved being a mom. She loved her kids and she felt like she had been made to be a mother and by all accounts she had. So why was this woman brutally murdered? Who would want to kill her? This is the question that police had as they are standing in her room looking at her dead, covered in stab wounds. As police searched the room further, they found something that to me like stood out and was a little bit weird. So they found that under the pillow that Marianne was sleeping on, there was a gun. There was like a gun under her pillow that had never been fired. And I guess this was like common. Marianne like had guns. She grew up around guns and her family. Guns were just there. So she always had one. She was always locked and loaded and she slept with one under her pillow. And to me, that's terrifying, which don't get me wrong. I know nothing about guns. I'm not like a gun person. I've never even shot a gun. But when I think about sleeping with a gun under my pillow, I feel like I would always be terrified that I would shoot myself in the head. And I'm sure it's not that easy to text. Well, you know, accidental shootings do happen. I don't know if they happen like that, but either way, she had the gun under her pillow and it had never even been fired, which told police that she had been like completely ambushed in her sleep because if she knew they were coming, she probably would have handled her business. You know what I mean? After looking at the scene and taking it in as a whole, they determined that this was a targeted attack. Somebody had gone there to kill Marianne because at first they thought maybe this was a robbery that had gone wrong, but nothing had been taken and nothing was looking like a robbery. It looked like somebody had came there with the one plan and that plan was to kill her. 
So what it looked like happened is that somebody had came and broke in through the back of the house. Police found a broken window at the back of the house and there was a brick nearby. So it was thought that this brick was used to smash the window, reach in, unlock the door somehow, you know, everybody, well, not everybody, somehow Marianne slept through this and didn't like have the reaction time to get her gun. And then they went in and they murdered her, murdered her, whoever they were. Police now want to question Carrie because I mean, she was the one person there at the time of the murders and she's the one that called 911. She's like the obvious, like first choice to question, right? So they want to ask her about that night, see if anything was weird, anything stood out, right? Cool. So they asked her like what happened and she was like, okay, so me and my mom were hanging out. My mom went to bed a little earlier than me and I stayed up in the dining room and I was scrapbooking her version of crack. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. It's from the office, moving on. So she's scrapbooking. It gets late, she goes to bed. And she says it's not long after she goes to bed that she hears a loud crash. And that crash is what she thought was somebody kicking in the back door. She said she hears this, she freaks out, she hears her mother start screaming. So, you know, she books it, she runs to the neighbor's house. The beginning of our story, right. And they did speak to the neighbor as well. And the neighbor said that they had heard like the sound of a scream, but they weren't sure when they heard it. And at the time that they heard it, they just attributed it to like some kids down the street making noise. So Carrie was taken to the police station and this is where she met up with her father, Don and her brother, Scott. The men were there obviously to like find out what was going on and also for police to question them because they had talked to Carrie. Carrie couldn't think of anybody who might want to hurt Marianne. So maybe, you know, her husband or her son might have a better idea. They're older, they've known her a little bit longer, but they questioned them and they have no idea who would want to hurt Marianne. So that wasn't super helpful, right? Like they couldn't give them any names to go on, but something that they did find to be helpful or useful when interviewing both the son and the dad is that Don, Marianne's husband, seemed to be a little bit weird. Like he seemed to be acting strangely. He didn't seem to be super affected by his wife's death. And this stood out to police, especially because, you know, he is the husband and it's almost always the husband. So this was noteworthy to them because he wasn't acting the way one might think a husband should act when learning that your wife has been brutally murdered in your home while you're at work. Now, their suspicion of Don was only strengthened when they, you know, canvassed the area and spoke to neighbors around because it appeared based on the neighbor's point of view that there may have been some trouble in paradise. So they were saying that Don liked to drink a little bit and that there seemed to be some trouble brewing between the couple because they often saw that Don was sleeping on the couch and he was not sleeping in the bed with his wife, which first off, these are nosy ass neighbors. Why are you looking through their windows to see where homeboy's sleeping? But they were, so they were able to tell police this, that there might be something going on. So they're putting a pin in him and they got to check his alibi. Cause remember he said he was at work, but they're like, mm, maybe you were, maybe you weren't. We're going to come back to you. In the meantime, police move on to their next suspect. So turns out that in addition to Don, like sleeping on the couch, Marianne had been having a little bit of a relationship with another man. So Marianne had worked at the Department of Public Safety for almost 30 years. And during that time, she had developed a little bit of a relationship with a coworker of hers. And it wasn't just like a little relationship, like this was a physical affair. And apparently they had been, you know, being physical for a while. So that's something. When they looked at her phone records, they found that she had actually spoken to this man the night that she was killed. And this was the last person that she had spoken to. Police track this guy down and they inform him that Marianne has been murdered. And to them, he seemed genuinely distraught. He seemed very open and very honest. He seemed like he wanted to help investigators any way that he could. He even let them like go through his phone. And they just said that he seemed truly heartbroken about what happened to Marianne. But of course, they were gonna have to check his alibi as well. You can't just go off of somebody acting sad because like if you kill somebody, you're probably gonna pretend to be sad about it. I mean, not always, right? Sometimes they don't care. But I feel like that would be like the, if you're trying to be deceitful, maybe you wanna pretend like you're upset about it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not trying to give you advice on how to get away with murder. I'm just saying like, this is what I would be thinking. Like if I, I you know, move, what? So police have these two people of interest. They're looking into their alibis and they're also looking a little more thoroughly, a little more diligently at the crime scene. And they're starting to see that the crime scene doesn't really add up, right? So you remember how I said that there was a broken window and that it was thought that somebody had broken through this window to like open the door to break into the house. Well, it appeared that the window had been broken from inside the house, like the glass and the brick was on the outside instead of being broke inside, which doesn't really make any sense. 
it just kind of looks staged. And on top of that, you remember how I said that Carrie said that immediately upon hearing her mom scream, she runs out of the house. It's 1 a.m. She calls 911. They get there. Boom, boom, boom. It happens super fast. Well, turns out that when they got there and they were looking at the scene, the blood at the scene had already started to dry and had started to coagulate. And this takes time, more time than Carrie was saying had passed between here and her mom's scream and her calling 911. Police then go to Don and they're like, hey, we would like permission to question your daughter again. And he was like, absolutely, go for it. So she's brought in for an official interview. They bring her in, they give her a polygraph test, which she fails. And it's at this point that they start pointing out the inconsistencies to her. The time, the fact that the blood had started to dry, the fact that the stage looks staged, the scene looks staged. And it's at this point that Carrie starts to change her story a little bit. And that's never a good sign, right? When you're presented with like facts that are indisputable, indisputable, and you start changing your story to match up with the facts, that's not good. So the officer who's like interrogating her senses her weakness at this point and decides they're going to change tactics a little bit. And they're like, listen, I know you're lying. What you're saying, the math ain't mathin'. You're not telling me the truth. So you better start or you're going to be in big trouble. The officer said specifically to her, quote, the timeline doesn't match. We know how long it took for the deputies to get there and go inside and find your mother. That would have been within minutes after you said you heard your mother scream. And I, at that point, if I was her, I would've been freaking out. And at 16, you know she was freaking out. Carrie then tells police like, okay, okay, I do have an idea who might've killed my mom. And she then tells police that the night that her mom was killed, when she heard the door get kicked in, she actually heard voices out in the house. And it was a voice of somebody that she recognized. So she had essentially been covering for this person so that they wouldn't get in trouble. Now, who was it? Was it her father? Was it her mother's workplace romance? No, it wasn't either of them. They actually both had alibis and both their alibis checked out. They looked into it and Don was at work at the time. He did not kill his wife and her workplace romance. They were able to look into his cell phone records and found that he was nowhere near the scene when it happened. So now I'm gonna throw a curveball at you and give you a whole new name, a whole new person's coming into this story. And this is Zane Ahmed. Now, who is Zane? We're gonna get into that now. Now, Zane was a guy from the neighborhood that Carrie knew. They weren't super close or anything. They were just friends. And I did see some reports that said that Zane might have had a crush on Carrie. And that's kind of how they knew each other. But Carrie wasn't into him. She wasn't into like his dark clothes and his facial piercings. He just wasn't somebody she was interested in romantically. She tells police that Zane might have had a reason for wanting to hurt her mother because Zane, you know, had feelings for Carrie and Carrie had been having trouble with her mother. So basically what happened there is Carrie had a new girlfriend and her mother who was old school was accepting of her dating a girl, though there was a bit of a learning curve because again, traditional woman, she did end up like coming to terms and being fine with the fact that her daughter was dating a, a girl, a woman. But her issue with the relationship was that there was a bit of an age gap. Carrie was 16 and her girlfriend whose name was Rebecca was 19. And Marianne had been very vocal. She was not secretive about her dislike for the age gap in the relationship. She took issue with this and some other stuff happened, but basically she got to a point where she told Carrie that she could no longer see her girlfriend, Rebecca, but Carrie still would. Now, because she had been told that she wasn't allowed to see her girlfriend, Carrie started getting like creative with how she would go about seeing her. She started like lying about where she was going. She would sneak out. She would wait till her mom went to bed and then she would like go and steal her mom's car keys and steal her car and go and drive to her. So she was like doing the most. And in one of these occasions, Rebecca had come over to her, her house and Carrie had gone outside and they were like hanging out in front of the house talking. Marianne, hears something, goes out front to catch them. Rebecca, runs into the night. And so Carrie and Marianne Murphy kind of get into a fight. And this is when Carrie tells her mother like, no, 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 mom. I was not out here seeing Rebecca. There was a masked man out here and I saw him and I came out here to try to look for him. Marianne hears this. She knows that it's bullshit because that's a ridiculous story. So she then grounds Carrie so that she cannot like see Rebecca and also can't call her. So basically making it so they can't talk at all. She says this is the point that Zane comes into the picture. So basically Carrie goes to Zane, expresses her woes to him and is like, hey, can you help me get out of being grounded? And she had a very creative way for doing this as well. She said that she asked Zane 
if he would come over to her house in the middle of the night and bang on the walls, you know, wearing a little mask and everything to scare her mother so that her mother would think that there really had been a masked man out there so that she would believe her daughter. And then she would get out of being grounded because she hadn't lied to her mom and hadn't been seeing Rebecca. See, when I say creative, like that's a thought, that is a thought. Carrie said when Zane came over that night, he was supposed to scare her mother from the outside. He wasn't supposed to come inside and he definitely wasn't supposed to murder her mother, but that he had, and she was scared. So she covered for him. Police hear this and they're not really sure how they feel about the story because it is like a weird story, but they know that they need to talk to Zane, right? And they look into Zane and they find that he actually has a record for trespassing, which, you know, is a far cry from murdering a woman in her sleep, but criminals do be criminal in sometimes, right? So they bring him in for questioning. Zane's brought in and immediately he seems scared, but not like I just murdered a woman and I don't want to get caught for it. Scared more like I'm a teenager in front of cops scared. And they look at him and they question him. And he says that, yes, he knew Carrie, like he knew her, but he hadn't killed her mother and hadn't been there the night that her mother was killed. And police actually believe him. They actually say that they didn't think he was bright enough to commit a murder, which like rude, but also like valid, I suppose. Like, I, I feel like you don't have to be bright to commit a murder, but maybe bright to like get away with it for a little bit. So they believe him and they're actually going to let him go, but they decide that they want to give him a polygraph test first, you know, dot all their I's, cross all their T's, make sure everything is done. So he goes in, he agrees. He goes in to take the polygraph test and he's actually in there like a while, like longer than one would normally be for their polygraph test. Then the lie detector person, the teacher, the lie detector teacher comes out, goes to investigators and is like, Hey, he'd like to confess. So apparently what happened is the lie detector teacher was giving him the lie detector test and it wasn't going super hot. Like he wasn't coming out looking great. So midway through the interview, he like stops and he's like, listen, I just want to tell the truth. I want to be honest. And this is when he tells her like what Carrie said is true. It is what happened. I went over there with the intention of just scaring her mother and what, for whatever reason, and I don't know why I brought a knife with me. He says he then went into the house. He went into Marianne's bedroom and he was just sort of standing over her when she woke up and she saw him. So he panicked and just started stabbing her over and over and over. So as I'm sure you can imagine, he was arrested and he was charged with murder and he was held on a $100,000 bail, which he actually did make. He was able to make bail after his mother. Oh my God. His mother had to pawn her jewelry. She had all this like really, really sentimental jewelry that had been passed down from generation to generation from when she lived in Pakistan and she had her like wedding band and she pawned all this, which this was all jewelry that she planned to give to Zane's sisters so that they could keep that tradition alive. And she pawned it. And this was used to make his bail and also pay for an attorney for him. And can you imagine having to do that for your kid? It's so messed up. So he's out, he has his attorney and his attorney's making statements, you know, saying he's innocent, saying they have testimony and video to prove that he wasn't involved, you know, all the things that they say. But then he said something interesting. His attorney said that it was either the desire of Carrie to cover her own tracks or to keep someone she knew from being blamed. And that's why she had thrown Zane under the bus. Now, why is this interesting? I'm going to tell you now, and it's going to blow your mind. Five months after Zane was arrested, right? His charges were dismissed and he was released. They realized they made a mistake. He wasn't involved at all. And two other people were arrested for Marianne's murder. This was her own daughter, 16 year old Carrie and Carrie's girlfriend, 19 year old Rebecca. Shaw Milan twists, right? What? Okay. Let's talk about Carrie. Carrie was born and raised in Texas and was from a loving middle-class family. She was born to her mom, Marianne and her dad, Don in a pretty happy and stable family. And she was the youngest child with an older brother named Scott. Mom and dad were both in the picture. Both worked super hard to have enough money to raise their kids and give them all they could. Her and her brother were super close and could talk about anything and everything. And she seemed to have a pretty normal home life, right? She was super close with her dad, definitely a daddy's girl, but her relationship with her mom was never quite as good. Basically her mom had super high expectations for both her and for her sons, uh, Scott, you know, Carrie's brother. So Carrie and Scott, she had high expectations for them. She pushed both of her kids to be the absolute best they could be. And for Carrie's brother, Scott, this came super easy. He was an academic. He was very good in school. All of this came easy for him, but Carrie had a bit of a harder time and she always felt like she wasn't really living up to her mom's expectations. 
Carrie found that this made her not only mad at her mother, but also resent for, resent for, resentful towards her brother because everything just seemed to come so easy to him, right? And it didn't for her. She was following him. She was trying to, you know, live up to what he was doing, follow in his footsteps, but she never felt like she did a good enough job. And she felt like she was like living in his shadow a little bit because he, you know, did super well. He'd already graduated. He'd already gotten a job, moved out, was on his own. He was doing super well while she was still in high school tripping over her own feet, essentially. At the time of the murder, Carrie was, you know, 16 years old. She was a freshman in high school and she was a bit of an outcast. She definitely wasn't popular by any means. And she had trouble fitting in with most of the kids at school. She was kind of trying to find herself. She switched her style often from dresses and boots to sideways hats and tank tops. She'd paint her nails black and wear lots of eyeshadow going for like the goth vibes. She was just trying on lots of different hats to see what would fit with her, which is totally normal for a 16 year old. When I tell you the looks that I went through, I didn't end up landing on like a super emo scene kid for a long time. And like, it's kind of stuck around because like, it wasn't a phase mom, but for her, she was just trying on different hats metaphorically and literally to see what worked for her, who she was. She was at a point where she was just like a little bit awkward, a little uncomfortable with herself, her body, who she was. She was a little bit thicker than the other girls in school. And this made her feel, you know, self-conscious and made her feel unattractive and unwanted. And as a woman who went through literally the exact thing growing up, it doesn't feel good. It is not easy to be a bigger woman at any point in your life, especially when like we are, I'm not going to get into, I was about to go on a rant. I'm not going to go on that rant, but you know what I'm going to say. It's very difficult to be a larger woman at any juncture in life. And it's particularly hard when you're a teenager and all you want is to be seen and loved. And you just don't want to be invisible and bigger girls in high school oftentimes are. Carrie ended up finding that sort of, you know, acceptance that she wanted when she ended up actually joining the choir, which was something that her mother loved. She loved seeing her have like a direction and a passion. And this was good for her because she also made a bunch of friends with the choir kids, kids with similar interests. And it was in choir that she would go on to meet a girl who would change her life forever. So in addition to all the other things that Carrie was, you know, going through, trying to find herself, trying to figure out who she was. She was also trying to come to terms with her sexuality. Growing up, she had always been attracted to, you know, boys, but she was coming to a place where she didn't think she was. That wasn't feeling like something for her anymore. And she thought that she was, you know, into women. So she ended up pursuing this interest and trying to find out where she fit in. And if she, you know, what her sexual preferences were, when she met a girl in choir class, and this was 19 year old Rebecca Keller. Rebecca, who went by Bunny, was a super outgoing person. She was high spirited and funny. And this immediately drew Carrie to her. And the attraction was mutual because Rebecca was super into her as well. Rebecca was cool, confident, popular, things that Carrie wanted to be. And Carrie actually had things that Rebecca wanted as well. Like Carrie had a stable family home and money and a present father and a good family. And Rebecca had grown grown up, excuse me, in a poorer community living in a trailer park. And she had like a really bad relationship with her father. So they kind of had things that the other person wanted. Their personalities were attracted to each other. They both were attracted to each other physically. It was a match. It was matching. The yin was yanging, but not in a good way. Cause look what we're talking about today. So the two started hanging out. And at first it was just like a friend thing. Cause Carrie was still like, you know, not sure about her sexuality. She wasn't sure. She knew she was attracted to her and she liked her, but she didn't know if she liked her in like the way you like a piece of art. You're like, this is beautiful. And I'm very attracted to you like mentally and emotionally, but maybe not physically. Right. So she wasn't sure if it was like that or if it was like a sexual attraction. But for Rebecca, Rebecca was sexually attracted to Carrie. She was bisexual and she was open with the fact that she liked Carrie. She let her know like, I like you. I'm into this. I would like this to happen. So she was showering her with attention and affection. And Carrie found that she did like this and she was into her in that way as well. Once the two went from just friends to more, the relationship was intense. It was like wildfire. It was strong and it was hot and it was passionate. And they, it was all in all consuming for both of them. Carrie was obsessed with Rebecca. And if you think about it, this was like her first relationship. This was the first time that she was feeling accepted and loved and wanted ever. So it was very important to her. It was shortly after the two got together that Carrie went to her brother. Cause I remember she felt like she could tell her brother anything. And she told him like, I think I'm gay. I think I'm into girls. I think I'm going to like date girls. And he was like, that's cool. Whatever, like whoever and whatever you want is fine. As long as you're happy, I don't care. Boogie down with your gay self, you know, right. 
the kind of brother we all deserve to have. I don't have a brother and I'm not gay, but you know what I mean. But where Scott was super accepting of, you know, her sexuality and relationships, because like, why wouldn't he be? Whose business is it? Who you are attracted to and who you're, you know, banging, like truly whose business is it, right? Like what, I'm sorry, I'm going to get on a thing, but what business do you have to like care about somebody's sexual preferences as long as they're not hurting anybody? Moving on. Um, she was worried that maybe her parents might not be. You know what I mean? Like she was worried that they might not be quite as accepting. They were a little bit more old school. She wasn't ready to come out and tell them. So her and Rebecca start, were still dating, but they were doing it secretly. She would sneak out. She would lie about where she was going. She would say she was with other friends or she was going to like the movies and she would instead sneak out and see Rebecca. And the two lived pretty close to each other. So this wasn't like a hard ruse to pull over one's eyes. No, it's the wool. It wasn't a hard wool to pull over her parents' eyes. It's a good sentence. I liked it. They did this for a while. This was the relationship they had for a while. But after a couple of months of dating, Rebecca was like, listen, I don't want to be like your dirty secret. You should be able to be open and honest with your family about who you are and what you want. You deserve that for yourself. And Carrie decided, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to take the time and I'm going to tell my family. And Carrie was surprised to find that when she told her parents, they were both like fine with it. She was expecting some sort of big thing, but they were both open and accepting. And they were like, whatever you want is fine. Like whoever you want is fine. As long as you're happy. Her mom had a little bit of a harder time with it because again, she was super old school, but she was willing to like grow and learn and change and be there for her daughter. So Carrie and Rebecca were stoked. They could be open with their relationship. They could scream their love to each other from the rooftops. And they were super excited to have this relationship together. They were making plans. They were like, we're going to go to California because California, you know, us in California are very progressive folks and they wanted to go somewhere they were, they could feel accepted and able to just be who they wanted to be without having to worry about people like being dicks about it. They were going to like get jobs and work hard and take care of each other and get a little house. And they were excited to build this life together. They felt like they had finally, finally, they felt like they had finally found their person but things were not as perfect as they were hoping it would be because as the relationship progressed, Marianne started to take issue with the fact that they were together, not about them being women together, but she didn't like the way Carrie was in the relationship. She could see that it was all consuming to her daughter. She could see how obsessed she was getting with Rebecca and could see that she didn't care about anything else. She wasn't working at school. She wasn't working hard on like, you know, going after like a career. She just was focusing on one thing and nothing else. And this was hard for her mother because her mother, remember, was somebody who wanted them, her kids, to live up to their potential and do the best that they could. So seeing her daughter kind of throwing all that away was incredibly difficult for her and she wasn't into it. Carrie's brother Scott even said of this time, quote, I have never seen Carrie become completely and utterly infatuated with a single person end quote. And this change in Carrie was frightening for her family, but that wasn't it. It wasn't just that she was obsessed and she was like, you know, not doing well in school and stuff. She had been like pushing boundaries. For example, her father, Don had come home to find Carrie and Rebecca and like a compromising position. And this was in their house and he was not fucking about it. Okay. One, he didn't like the fact that his daughter was sexually active. And two, the fact that she had brought her girlfriend into the house, like it wasn't cool. And if that wasn't bad enough, Mary Ann actually called the cops on Rebecca when this happened. She had Rebecca charged with trespassing because Rebecca had quote, unlawfully and with notice that entry was forbidden, intentionally and knowingly entered and remained in habitation of Mary Ann Murphy's home without her consent. Now, Rebecca was arrested for this, but she did get uh, released while she was waiting for like the trial on the trespassing charge. And this all happened the March before the murder. So things weren't good. Carrie was pissed at her mom. There was a lot of tension. Scott said, you could cut that tension with a knife. And Carrie and her mother were not speaking to each other. They'd be like, you know, breakfast is ready, time for bed. Like they weren't talking. That was all they were saying. But Carrie was still talking to Rebecca, even though she had been grounded and her phone was taken away and it was all this jazz. Rebecca had actually given Carrie a cell phone that they called the bunny phone so that the two of them could communicate when they weren't allowed to talk to each other, which Put a pin in the bunny phone because that is going to come back later. But first, let's go back to Zane and wrap up those loose ends real quick. When Zane was first arrested, people really believed he was involved. And remember, it took like five months before they dropped the charges against him. So his attorney, his family was advocating for him, saying that he wasn't responsible, but people really believed he was. And this is probably because in the early reportings of this case, it was reported 
that the murder weapon was found in Zane's home. And I have no idea where the hell they got this information because it turned out that no, that wasn't even true. The knife that they were talking about, like a knife that was found in his house was just like a tiny pocket knife that he used to like clean dirt out from under his fingernails. But it was reported to the public that the murder weapon was found in his house. It's super messed up that he had to go through this and that the public had to think he was responsible because this is something that's going to like ruin your life. You know what I mean? Especially in like the community. If you want to keep living there, people are always going to, you know, remember that about you. And police should have caught on pretty quick that he wasn't involved. It seems like it was pretty avoidable because so they question him, they interrogate him. He confesses to stabbing her over and over and over. He's arrested. He's charged. But police always felt like his confession was a little bit weird. Like somebody confessing to the murder that was already implicated in the murder should have been a slam dunk, but they knew that it seemed off. He seemed off. His story was weird. He seemed like he was under the influence of something. Like they were skeptical right from the beginning. They question him to see if he can give them any concrete information that shows that he was there and that he was involved. You know, they were trying to pull some guilt knowledge out of him. So they ask him to describe like what happened when he went there to describe what happened when he murdered Marianne. Specifically, they're like, okay, you enter the home, you go to Marianne's room. Tell me how you got there. And his answer is something that would have made investigators ears perk up immediately because he starts describing going into the house and he says he goes up the stairs to go to Marianne's room. But here's the thing. The Murphys had a one story floor. Floor? The Murphys had a one story home. There were no stairs inside that house so he wouldn't climb stairs to get into her room. On top of that, he tells police he stabbed her four times. She was stabbed 73 times. So the math isn't math in here. On top of that, when police looked into whether or not he had an alibi, it turns out he did. He had been at home playing video games with his family. And of course a family could lie for you, but they were able to determine that the family didn't lie for him because they had actually taken a photo that night and they were able to prove that it was taken that night. But regardless of this, he was arrested and charged with murder. Now I did see some interviews with investigators that were involved and they try to make it sound ugh, so laughable. They try to make it sound like they caught on super fast to the fact that he wasn't involved and like let him go. But in actuality, he was under suspicion for months and his mother had to pawn all her priceless jewelry to get him out of jail. And I have no idea if they were ever able to get this jewelry back. I know in an interview with Zane, he said one of the first things he wanted to do once like he was released and everything was cool is he wanted to get a job so that he could earn some money so that he could get this jewelry back. But imagine if it never was like that, breaks my heart. Now, why did he confess? That's the question, right? Because it's always a question. Why do people confess to things that they don't do? He says that he just was telling police whatever they wanted to hear because he wanted to go home and he thought that they would let him. They realized that Zane was not of average intelligence and just didn't realize what was going on or how serious this was. He was scared and intimidated by the whole process. And some people said that his confession was coerced, but they said that he didn't have the education or maturity level to understand or comprehend what was going on. He said that when he confessed, he had been interviewed or interrogated for like eight to 12 hours. They had taken his photo. They had taken his saliva. He was like terrified and didn't know better. He said his heart was racing. And when they came and they picked him up for questioning, he was just like, like, what the hell is going on? And he said specifically of this quote, I just told them I did it because I was scared and nervous. I was shaking end quote. And his sister said that she believes that under the conditions that he was under, that many people would confess just out of being scared. He has since come out and said that it was obviously stupid for him to confess to something he didn't do, especially something so serious. But I mean, yeah, it's a dumb thing to do. It's something that I would like to think I wouldn't do, but I've never been in that position. And we see it happen all the time. And I'll never understand the psychology behind that. I know there are like studies on it, but I'm just like, wow, sirs, sir. So now how did police get to Carrie in the first place? Well, they're doing the whole thing with Zane and they're noticing that he has a lot of inconsistencies in his story. So they start to think that maybe Carrie and Zane had done this together. Like they had worked together to kill her mother. They were like, okay, Zane's stories aren't adding up. Who led us to Zane? Carrie. And Zane confessed, so obviously he's involved in some way, but if his story's not lining up completely, maybe we should look at the girl who's been lying to us the whole time anyway. I mean, she was the last person who was with our victim. She's a liar. This might be something we want to look into. So they decide to go back and try to talk to her again. And it's at this point that she is different. She's less forthcoming. She's less helpful. She's more guarded. And she lawyers up real quick. 
It's at this point the police kind of go to Scott, Carrie's brother, and they ask him, like, what's going on? And I think they ask him, like, if he has any reason to believe that his sister could be involved in his mother's murder, which is so sad. But he tells them about the issues between Carrie and Marianne at the time that the murder happened and all the issues with Rebecca. They now want to look into Rebecca and their relationship further because they think there are definitely reasons that Rebecca might want something to happen to Marianne, right? I mean, first off, trying to stop the relationship. And Marianne had literally called the cops on her and police had spoken to some friends and they had found that Rebecca had been pretty open with the fact that she was pissed that Marianne had called the cops on her. To get started looking further into Rebecca, they decide that they want to get access to the bunny phone. Remember we put a pin on that? We're taking the pin out. We're bringing the bunny phone back front and center because they realized they're like, okay, Carrie had the bunny phone. She had the cell phone the night her mom was killed, but yet she ran to the neighbor's house to call the cops. She didn't use the cell phone. Why would that be? Could it be because there's something on that cell phone that they, she, and Rebecca, or just she, doesn't want us to see? Maybe, but they don't have access to the bunny phone, so they actually asked Scott for the phone number, and I guess they were able to get the records from the phone number. And in the meantime, they bring Rebecca in to talk to her as well. Apparently, Rebecca acts totally cool, calm, collected. She's very forthcoming. She appears to be honest. She tells police, like, yes, me and Carrie really liked each other and we dated, but it wasn't working out. It was hard with her family. I didn't want to be involved in the drama. So we haven't talked in a month. But the lie detector determined that was a lie. Not an actual lie detector because she was given a polygraph test and somehow she passed. But you know what I mean. Turns out when they looked at these phone records, they were talking all the time. They had actually started talking more since being told that they weren't allowed to talk to each other. And it turns out they were talking and texting a lot the day and the night of the murder. So they go in and they tell her, hey, we know that's a lie. We know about the bunny phone. We saw how much you guys are talking. We see the text. We have the records. We know that you were talking the night of the murder. So what's up, bro? Slash Rebecca. This is when she changes her story and a little more of the truth starts to come out. She says, yes, you're right. I did talk to her that night. I was even there that night. She says that that night, Carrie called her and told her like, I killed my mother. So she shows up at the house. She finds Carrie there covered in her mom's blood and Carrie's freaking out. So she tries to console her girlfriend as a good girlfriend would. And she's like, listen, I will help you get out of this. We need to make this look like a burglary so you can get away with this. And this is when Carrie was like, Yes, I'm going to blame it on Zane. Police were able to determine that Rebecca's story was at least partially true. They were able to tell that Carrie had been looking into how to kill her mother. She had even Googled, like, what is the quickest way to kill somebody? But they were thinking that Rebecca knew more than she was saying, and that she was more involved than she was saying, because at the same time that Carrie was Googling, like, how to kill her mom super fast, she was on the phone with Rebecca. So believing that both girls were involved with the murder of Marianne, both girls were arrested. Carrie was arrested first shortly after Zane and Rebecca was arrested after and both girls were charged with first degree murder. And I believe Rebecca was also charged with the sexual assault of a minor because Carrie was 16 and the age of consent in Texas is 17. They were both given bail, which Carrie's family did post for her, but Rebecca's family couldn't afford the $80,000 bail. So she sat in jail the whole time. Rebecca's neighbors were stunned when she was arrested. Apparently she was like a good kid. They all thought that she was like really sweet. She was respectful. She would hang out with her family. She would help clean up the yard. She was just known as being like a good kid and not somebody you would ever think was going to be involved in something like this. Now, both girls are arrested, but police realize that they're going to have a little bit of trouble at trial because they know both girls are involved, but they don't know in what capacity they're involved. Like they don't know who did the actual stabbing. And that is important because it is like, different. So they're like, we need to figure out who did this. But this question would soon be answered by the girls themselves and not because they wanted to confess because they're dumb. So apparently what had happened was is while Carrie was out walking the streets, living free while she awaited trial and Rebecca was in jail, the two were talking on the phone. And you and I both know that these phone calls are recorded. And it seems like they knew this too, because they tried to be slick. I told you Carrie is nothing if not creative. So she, I don't know if she got Rebecca to do this or if Rebecca was also creative. Creative, basically they had been talking through another inmate's like calling number. I guess they each have their own so that you can like monitor it. So she had used another inmate's calling number so that when the phone calls were recorded, they wouldn't show like on Rebecca's record. But police found out about this, obviously. And they found out that the girls had talked hundreds of times in the time that they were waiting for trial to begin. 
So police listen to these calls. And in one of these calls, Rebecca literally says to Carrie, like, I'm just glad you didn't have to see what happened in there. And Carrie was like, the thing is I did see it. I was in the hallway and I watched. And then Rebecca responds with, oh, I told you to stay in your room. You weren't supposed to see anything. So now police know that it's Rebecca who did the stabbing. So now they know what happened that night. Carrie called Rebecca over and when Rebecca showed up, she brought a knife with her. She went into Marianne's room while she slept, telling Carrie to go in her room so she didn't have to see and hopefully not hear that much. And then she went in there and she stabbed Marianne to death. The two then tried to stage the scene and Rebecca left. And once Rebecca had been gone long enough to like get far enough away that they felt safe, Carrie put on the presentation of her life, ran to her neighbor's house and called 911. It also turns out when they listened to these recordings, they were able to determine why Marianne had been killed specifically on this day. So what had happened is Carrie and Rebecca had been communicating through the bunny phone and Carrie got caught doing this. And her mom took the phone and was like, what's the passcode? Give me the passcode. And Carrie refused to give it, give it to her. So Marianne was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take this with me to work. I have somebody there who can get into this and I'm going to find out what is on this phone. The girls were worried that if Marianne got into this phone, Rebecca would go to jail because the two had been sending illicit photos. They had been sexting all of that stuff. And Rebecca was too old to be doing this. It was technically illegal. So they were worried Rebecca was going to go to jail. So that day they started Googling how to murder somebody quickly. It was very hard for Carrie's family to believe that she was involved. Like her grandma, Marianne's mother said that Carrie and her mom had a good relationship. Like they would fight, but they would always make up with each other. And she said specifically at this quote, they would have fights, but they would always say, I'm sorry. They would always say, I love you. But I guess the fighting got pretty bad. It got so bad that even a neighbor knew that stuff was going on. A neighbor nearby said that they knew that Marianne was not happy about the two dating and he or she, I can't remember, also knew that they were always fighting. They said that at least every day or every other day, Marianne and Carrie's arguments would like spill out of the garage and he would just see them arguing and fighting. In December of 2012, two days before Carrie's 17th birthday, the judge decided that Carrie, who had prior to this been treated as a minor, was going to be tried as an adult. This was decided after it was determined that, quote, there is little, if any, prospect of adequate protection of the public and likelihood of reasonable rehabilitation by use of procedures, services, and facilities, facilities currently available to the juvenile court, end quote. And this is when Carrie's name was finally released to the public because prior to this, they were keeping her name private because she was considered a juvenile. But guess what, bitch, we know your name now. I'm sorry, I'm a little spicy. The prosecutor said that they were super happy that Carrie was gonna be tried as an adult. They said that this was a cold hearted execution and they had been worried that she was gonna go through like the juvenile court system. And they were concerned about this because like the cap for the crime she had committed would have been 40 years if she had gone through the juvenile system. And they wanted to go after the actual most at trial. But a trial never actually happened because both girls ended up pleading guilty. Now, Rebecca was the first of the two girls to plead guilty. Basically, right before jury selection was set to begin on her case, in a last minute decision, Rebecca admitted guilt. Kinda. She admitted to the court that she participated in the planning of the crime, had purchased the knife used in the murder, and had assisted in staging the break-in and disposing of evidence. Which is like, okay, cool. But she did sort of admit guilt to being the person to actually stab Marianne over the phone. So I thought at first that it was weird that they would accept this plea deal. But it turns out there was Le Scandial in the court system. Basically, what had happened was, is the lead investigator on Marianne's murder case had had a relationship, a quote, consensual sexual encounter with a key witness in another murder case, a super high profile murder case that I may cover, I may not, I haven't decided yet. But he got fired for this. This was like a super big deal. He was fired at the time he was fired. He was the lead investigator on eight, at least eight pending murder cases. This one included in that. And they were worried that if this case went to trial, he would get called as like a witness at the trial. And they didn't think that that would look super good. I mean, think about it. They had already arrested and charged 20 year old Zane with the murder when it turns out he was not involved. So would it really look super good for the lead investigator to be the type that would rush to judgment like that and also bang witnesses? It would really make you question how good of an investigator this guy was, right? And it was, per this is like the kind of thing a defense attorney would sink their teeth into. I mean, Rebecca's attorney even said of this quote, 
The general idea is that when you have any law enforcement officer, especially someone who has that much responsibility, commit some act of misconduct and then is terminated, then that certainly casts a shadow on that person's work. Anyways, with that said, both girls were given deals to avoid trial and both girls pled guilty. So Rebecca was given 60 years for her involvement and she will first be eligible for parole in 2042 when she is 50 years old. And as far as Carrie goes, she was given 30 years for her involvement in the murder, which means that she will be eligible for parole in 2028 when she is 32 years old. It is so sad, man. I cannot imagine being in that family. I cannot imagine being Scott or Don knowing that your mother and wife were murdered and that your daughter slash sister were responsible. That is so sad. Scott said of losing his mother, quote, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't miss her. I miss her more than anything, but I think she was doing what she thought was right to make sure her child succeeded. But the obsession with being in love with each other drove them to do one of the darkest things I can ever imagine. The darkest thing he could ever imagine. And for what? This big love, this huge relationship that didn't matter and didn't last anyway. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, once they were arrested, the two broke up of course, but don't worry. They have remained friends and stay in communication to this day. Whatever. Rebecca did try to appeal, uh, but after an independent review, it was found that there were no arguable grounds for this review and therefore her appeal was frivolous. And as for Carrie goes, I did not see that she tried to appeal or anything like that, but I did see that she has a right of prisoner page. You guys know how much I love a right of prisoner page. On this page, you know, she has photos of herself and she tells you that she is 5'10 with a nice shape, brown hair, pretty hazel eyes, rosy cheeks, fair skin, some freckles, a beautiful smile, and she is a bisexual Capricorn. And then she says of herself, quote, I have learned so much about myself and life through this journey I'm on. I believe everyone makes mistakes and deserves the chance to learn and grow from them. And with that, that, my friends, is the story of the tragic murder of Marianne Murphy. I hope that it was informative and made sense, and I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Marianne with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day, and that is this. Who do you believe was the mastermind behind the murder of Marianne Murphy? Was it Rebecca or was it Carrie? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Anyways, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a case suggestion down in the comment section. Like any case you want to see me cover, leave it down there. Anytime you leave a suggestion down there, I put it on a list and I put your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking at the cases you guys recommend to me because you often suggest cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my membership, where you get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. I want to say one more thank you to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. It's sponsors like Aura that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.